Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my talk today will be about how authoritarian states are actually exploiting the power of the web in order to uh, crack down on various dissenting uh, movements pushing for democracy. So uh, what I'm gonna say today may be a little bit contradictory to the common narrative that many of you have been exposed to in the traditional media where uh, we have heard a lot of stories about the impact of the internet on protest movements. We've heard a lot about the information revolution and how it's transforming countries like China, countries like Iran, even many of the countries in the former Soviet Union. Uh, and you know, the assumption so far has been that the internet is basically a very good thing when it comes to promoting democracy. So many of these uh, illusions uh, were put together uh, in the mid-90s by uh, thinkers which I can only call cyber utopians. People who really believed in the uh, transformative power of the web uh, to change societies and to change them for the better. So one of the leading thinkers here has been Nicholas Negroponte, who you may know most recently as the founder of the One Laptop Per Child project. He wrote a very influential book in the mid-90s uh, called Being Digital, where he basically argued that uh, electronic communications and the internet will make the nation state disappear, everything will become decentralized, and there will be no more room for nationalism as there is no more room for smallpox, the very famous quote, which is now very often quoted to illustrate this very naive view that many people had back at the time. Uh, of course, many of these views have influenced very heavily what politicians think about the political power of the web. Uh, so you can actually go and track back uh, and see many of the American presidents uh, being very enthusiastic about what the internet can do, right? From even Ronald Reagan talking about, you know, the microchip to, you know, most recently George Bush. And you can trace this back even to Obama and you will see more or less similar sentiment being, being exposed by the politicians in Britain. You may all remember uh, several speeches which Gordon Brown made earlier this year where he basically argued that technology has a very great impact on global politics and the most famous quote was that if social networking and blogging was around in the you know, early 90s, the genocide in Rwanda wouldn't have happened. Right? That's, uh, I think, a particular acute uh, exhibit of uh, cyber utopianism uh, in action. So many of the people who still believe in this really think that uh, blogs are more or less uh, what faxes and Xerox machines were you know, in the late 80s, where the great dissident movements in Poland and Eastern Europe really embraced uh, this technology. Right? So essentially this argument is about economics and logistics. The internet and new media has, have made it really cheap for people to produce content, and of course the activists and the NGOs will inevitably use this technology in order to push for reform and change, right? Uh, so, you know, if you really want to sum up this view, it basically says that if you have enough connectivity and enough devices, democracy is almost inevitable, right? And that explains why we have seen so many pushes to, you know, get China online, get Iran online, get Russia online, make sure that people have enough connectivity, make sure that people know what blogging is, make sure that people know what connectivity is, and somehow, although no one explained how exactly, these people will use these tools to ask for more democracy and you know, collaborate together and, and push for more stuff. Um, and you know, w w one of the names which uh, pundits have developed for this particular view is iPod liberalism. It's this belief that you know, people who have uh, iPods or any other sort of modern Western technology will also be very likely uh, to support uh, Western values and Western democracy, right? So the assumption here is that if you give all Chinese or Iranians or Russians you know, enough iPods or enough laptops or enough you know, fax machines, they will all somehow on their own aspire uh, to democratic change, right? And of course, uh, this would make a fascinating, you know, title for a column by Thomas Friedman, you know, drop iPod, not bombs, but, you know, this is rarely a good sign, 
right? Uh, it's a view which essentially disregards a lot of political, cultural, and sociological forces which are at place in the societies and uh, embraces a very deterministic picture of uh, the role that technology plays, right? And the main confusion here is due to the fact that we actually uh, tend to confuse the intended uses of technology with the actual uses, right? Just like we may want to think that, you know, radio, for example, can help establish democracy in, you know, a country like the Soviet Union, which it partly did. You know, it was also used very actively during the very Rwandan genocide that, you know, we wanted to avert, right? So the actual uses of technology do not necessarily always coincide with their intended uses. So in this talk, I'll try to expose you really with a lot of examples and anecdotes to uh, three ways, which is not, you know, it's, it's more than three, you know, in, in, in reality, but I'll focus on three which I think are most important, the ways in which authoritarian governments actually use the web. So they actually use us as opposed to the intended ones. As you can see, those are three. It's to spread propaganda, it's to generate useful information which these regimes need to run themselves, and it's to try to erode and subvert civic engagement, particularly among young people. And I have sort of three very handy labels for each of those. It's the spinternet, which I'll explain in a moment. It's authoritarian deliberation, and it's the problem of digital captives. Uh, so the rise of the spinternet, right? Uh, you may wonder where this name comes from. Uh, it's basically, you know, coinage from uh, spin and internet, right? So the spinternet is, uh, I think this label applies to much of the internet we now see in Russia, China, Iran, uh, and, many, and many other countries. But before I sort of jump right into examples, I'll just let talk a little bit what exactly is new about this new social media world with sites like Wikipedia, Dig, and many others. We tend to believe that, you know, they are very decentralized, users can actually determine what's on their front page, right? So authorities will find it very hard to actually control what's being seen and what's being read. And that's their value as opposed to, you know, Pravda or any of the Chinese state news agencies, right? The problem is that if you actually look at how the agenda is being set on many of these websites, you'll see that despite this very decentralized nature that they aspire to have, they still have this very extremely powerful groups right, who actually determine uh, what's happening on those sites, right, and who are disproportionately more powerful than an average user. So, for example, a site like Dig, where, you know, users vote on news that get on the front page, right, if you're an average user, uh, you know, there is a 98% chance that your vote wouldn't actually count, right, that your vote wouldn't result in your story being submitted to the front page. So there are these very powerful clicks which are very influential, and if you manage to penetrate and influence them, it means you can also set a lot of the agenda uh, on these sites, right? So just keep that in mind uh, before we move on. And obviously, since uh, these sites all rely on voting, and that voting is very non-transparent, there appear more and more companies which actually aspire to gain those votes, right? So there are companies like Subvert and Profit, for example, which would let you game any of the social new media websites. So if you want to place your product or idea or ideology on the front page of Dick, you can go and buy votes, right? And they do it, of course, in the black market, so to say, but nevertheless, this is happening, right? So if you really want to start controlling this agenda in social media, all you need is a budget, right? And many authoritarian governments have that budget. There are other companies like YouSocial, which more or less offer you the same service. You want to get on the front page of any of the sites, you go and pay up. Right? And again, you have to uh, keep in mind that the argument often put forward by the uh, people who really are fans of social media is that unlike traditional media, it's very hard to game. Right? It's not subject to oligarchic interest, it's not subject to corporate agenda, and thus it's more democratic, right? And as we see, there are numerous ways to actually go ahead and game it. I mean, the same company, you social, for example, also offers you a chance to add as many friends as you want to your Facebook list, as long as you're willing to pay. So for 20 cents, you can actually go and add a new friend, and you know, if you're a politician, or if you are a party aspiring to get 5,000 followers, on you know, Facebook, you can do the math, right? So it's, it's, it's gonna be pretty easy. 
The same we are seeing with uh, what's called search engine optimization, where there are artificial methods to actually trick how results on Google are being displayed, right? So if you want, for example, to go and search for complaints about a particular company, and if you realize that when somebody searches for, you know, Shell or ExxonMobil or any other company, and you see that the, among the first 20 results, there are some critical ones, you can actually go and start hiring companies which will sort of whitewash uh, and make them disappear from Google. They will not disappear from the internet, but they will still disappear from, you know, the most common way to find stuff now from Google, right? And of course, you can think one way further and uh, try to analyze how dictators and certain governments would want to use this. Would Chinese want to see any criticism of them in English online? They can actually go and buy services like this one? Uh, I don't think they will. I mean, of course, much of this is actually happening and being developed in the Western world. I mean, Israel has emerged as one of the top laboratories where tools to influence sort of online public opinion are actually being developed. So there is this very interesting tool called the Megaphone, which basically monitors all online surveys and polls where the number of, where the question of Israel and Palestine is mentioned, and it alerts uh, its fans to go and vote. So every time there is something where international opinion can actually be surveyed, you get a pop-up and you're encouraged to go and vote on this particular page, right? And again, you can push this one way further and think uh, how exactly you can apply it from, you know, the propaganda perspective to actually go and start influencing people, you know, who work for you. Um, I'll skip this one again. This is happening in the UK as well. I mean, again, much of this innovation is happening not in authoritarian states. It's being imported by authoritarian states, but it's being happening. It's happening somewhere else. So here you see an example of you know the, the British uh, you know government actually training their own uh, you know pro-West Islamic groups on how to game Google. Essentially, it's the same trick we've seen with search engine optimization, right? So all of this is happening. Uh, and of course, some of it actually ends up in China. You know, as, as you see, there are some more and more techniques and ways in which a lot of knowledge being developed in the West and Britain actually ends up in those certain states. Uh, but to get a little bit closer to, 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 to the actual certain states, you can see that in China, for example, uh, much of this spinning is being done by what's called 50 cent party, right? And those are people who are being paid 50 cents for every comment then they live online which supports the government. So basically, the government has created this very shadow network of you know, almost 300,000 people who monitor interesting discussions online, and whenever someone says something negative about the government, they actually you know, go online and leave a comment and then receive their paycheck, right? Which, again, is very interesting, but it's very sophisticated. You know, there are different levels of how it's being done. There is a national level. It is also a local level, uh, but again, even some sites in China, the new sites actually required to keep these people on staff, right? So that they can then disp be dispatched in order to spin the discussions, right? In Russia, it's happening slightly differently. They don't have 300,000 people to do it, but they have created a number of startups, right? Which are headed by people who are very loyal to the Kremlin, Right? and who are actually overseeing many of the sites which then influence public opinion. Kremlin even started something called the Kremlin School of Bloggers, where the pro-government you know, ideology experts actually train bloggers on how to correctly uh, discuss various you know, geopolitical issues and national issues. Right? So all of this is happening and there is money being poured into this in order to control the message. You know, the same we see happening in Iran to control the religious discourse. So in Iran, you see uh, particular workshops in cities like Qom, you know, which is the religious center in the country, where people are being trained how to blog properly about religious issues. In particular, this effort targets women. You know, the blogging women are a particular threat to, to the clerics, and they don't really want them to uh, expose what it's like uh, to be, you know, a, a, a you know, bl blogging woman in Iran. And of course, they are trying to control this. And as we see, uh, those efforts actually are paying off. I mean, I wouldn't go too deep into what happened in Iran this summer, but uh, there are more and more indications that uh, the government uh, investment into controlling social media is actually finally paying off. We're actually beginning to see that there are more and more pro-government messages being posted on the same networks used by activists. So it's Twitter, Facebook, and all others are subject to the government propaganda just like uh, they are subject to uh, the activist propaganda. 
and you know, activist campaigns. Uh, we see that happen also in Nigeria, for example, with the government that recently announced a $5 million project to basically try to wipe out the entire you know, anti-president uh, uh, online opposition. Right? So people are heavily investing into this, and then, you know, it's, as you can read in the details, you know, they're trying to recruit hundreds of people who are being paid in, you know, cyber cafe vouchers. You know, they're not necessarily being paid in cash, they're being paid in allowances and, you know, the time that they can spend online, right? So uh, it's not limited only to, you know, Russia, China, and Iran. You know, same we see happen in, 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 in Egypt, but, you know, I'll, I can give you many more examples. The key point here about this internet is that this is happening, in my opinion, because the governments have lost control to fully censor and control the internet, right? If they could really delete everything from the web without leaving any trace, they probably would. The problem is that the internet is so uh, uh, hard to control that even if they delete something from a particular blog, it only encourages more people to actually go ahead and start reposting it elsewhere. So instead of censoring it, I, my, my, my theory is that they're actually beginning to spin it and that, that actually helps to distract uh, and diffuse the issue, right? So uh, quickly moving on to the second element, the authoritarian deliberation. And again, we have, as I've mentioned previously, somewhat of a myth that authoritarian leaders and dictators somehow fear the internet, right? they fear technology. And again, if you really look very closely at how government leaders are trying to sort of reach out to their different netizens and, you know, and internet users, that's actually not the case. Pretty much across the board, with an exception probably of North Korea and Burma, authoritarian leaders are actually very actively engaging with technology, computers, uh, you know, and so forth. Here's a quote from Hu Jintao, who actually, you know, very uh, eloquently says that, yes, they do pay great attention to what's being said, uh, and, you know, they do think that the web is an important channel for them to engage with people, right? And again, they're not really hiding those attitudes. Um, and, you know, sometimes they do allow debate around issues which are not political. So they do allow debate about issues like, you know, the earthquake, which, you know, took place uh, recently. They do allow debate around uh, some non-political issues like climate change. All of that is happening. It's just that it's not happening on issues like human rights, for example. So you can see, you know, there is criticism in Chinese blogs. It's actually there is much more criticism than non-criticism, you know, and it's both of national and local governments. The question then is, why does the government tolerate it, right? And um, I'll, 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 I'll skip w w one of the anecdotes, but uh, the reason why the government is tolerating this, I argue, are threefold. First is to generate information that the government needs to run the country. Right. Most of these uh, bureaucrats in the government, in, in Russia, China, Iran, or elsewhere, they operate in huge information vacuum. They don't really know fully what's happening in the outer regions. So for them, having people blog and having people voluntarily provide information about what may be wrong with some local issues is actually quite helpful because then it helps them to crack down on local corruption, misbehavior, you know, and go actually you know, fix some of the problems which may not be political in nature, but which may help them to, you know, survive into the next, uh, you know, century. Um, the second, uh, you know, it's just helpful to start sharing the blame for whatever goes wrong, because then you say, well, you know, we did reach out to you, we did listen to you, we did ask you your question, we did ask your opinion. Well, if something goes wrong, then you can actually go and start blaming it on people who help you shape that opinion, right? And third, it just helps increase legitimacy. You know, as any authoritarian regime, uh, knows well, they do need to maintain a certain amount of legitimacy both at home and abroad, right? So for them, uh, sort of having this fake opening up uh, in cyberspace is actually very useful because it reduces tension and it convinces some people at least that yes, they are willing to consider outside views and opinions, right? And again, I, I would just urge you, I don't have time to go into this now, there is a very interesting paper about the authoritarian deliberation in the Chinese context which does study this in very great depth and which argues that, you know, maybe it is one way in which the Communist Party in China will actually survive without having to come up with any new ideology and which, you know, may actually increase its political capacities without necessarily leading to any regime-wide democratization. I think this is a question, and the internet playing here not a particularly great role, but that's a climate in many of these countries that we need to be uh, comfortable with. 
We see it's in, you know, we see projects in uh, Russia, for example. That's a project called Liberty Ru, you know, which is, you know, as close as it gets to freedom, which is actually developed by one of the key uh, PR architects of both Yeltsin and Putin eras by Gleb Pavlovsky. And the, that's a mix between a social network and a blog. And this entire idea is actually to tap into the creative potential of some internet users in Russia and to help them shape the new Russian ideology. Right? So Pavlovsky is very forthcoming on this issue, and he does acknowledge that you know, they want to try to leverage the ideas of this very creative internet users and to shape them into concrete policy points, right? For and agenda points for political parties. And of course, we know there is only one political party uh, in Russia which is in power. And you know, my understanding is that they don't really want to listen to those people that much. It's more of a way to signal to the Russian internet that yes, we will listen to you guys, we will incorporate some of your points, uh, but you know, it, 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 it's not necessarily going to lead to anything, right? Other than uh, helping those people blow their steam off and helping again to increase legitimacy. Uh, some of this is happening slightly differently in other countries. It's, you know, they may be still spinning it, but they're also trying to leverage the support of their users online in cyberspace, right? So for example, in Thailand, there's a very interesting site called Protect the King, started by one of their uh, members of parliament, which basically encourages users, you know, internet users, to go and start submitting links to websites which they may find offensive to the king. So you can basically go and nominate any of the websites that you don't like, and uh, it will be almost within 24 hours uh, blocked, and then you need to go through a very complex procedure to unblock it. Right, and because there are very severe in the last majesty laws in Thailand, you know, that works very well. Once they launch it in 24 hours, they got like 3,000 websites blocked. Right, and there are a lot of loyalists who actually are very happy to contribute their knowledge and tips and whatnot to have those websites censored. The same we see happening in Saudi Arabia where, you know, internet users are encouraged to go and search YouTube for videos which may offend Saudi sensibilities and then to nominate them for deletion. Right? And then if uh, that particular video accumulates a critical mass, then YouTube will have to delete it, or will have to consider deleting it because so many people have complained. Right? So there are organized campaigns actually to try to go and influence the decisions even of Western companies uh, on this issue. I see, we, again, I, I said I wouldn't be talking much about Iran, but here's one more example of uh, you know, how uh, the Iranian authorities after the protests are now, you know, are uh, slowing down, I actually looking at all of the online evidence trail left on Facebook and Twitter to actually go and start cracking down on uh, people who were active in cyberspace, right? So now one of their initiatives now is actually putting online the pictures of protesters in the street uh, so that they can actually be identified. So they're crowdsourcing this process of matching faces to names. Right? And of course, you can guess what's going to happen once they know who you know, the, the protesters were. Um, my final part here would be, again, about uh, the cyber-topian assumption that somehow the younger generation, which has not been subject to brainwashing, which is all about digital media, mobile phones, you know, Blackberries and laptops, will somehow be prone to you know, revolution, or will be prone to embrace democratic values. The problem here is, again, that we hear quite a lot about cyber activism, right? But we hear very little about what are called cyber hedonism, right? Where the young people may not necessarily be that crazy about participating in any political action, whether it's online or offline, because of all of the good things that the internet has to offer. I mean, first of all, you know, there is much less political content, news content on the internet than we think. It's an interesting study from 2007, which basically shows you uh, traffic to various kinds of sites online, right? And you see that adult content, which is pornography, you know, and instant messaging and email, still occupies proportionally much more space uh, than politics or news, right? And again, we have to keep that in perspective that most of what young people do online revolves around, you know, them communicating to each other or downloading entertainment, right? And uh, it's not at all clear how they will advance to this level of actually being um, politically active. So what we really have to consider is what if the internet is not this catalyst of social change that we expected it to be? 
what if it is the new opium for the masses, which will actually will keep these young people, you know, chained in their basements, exploring social networking, you know, downloading pornography and whatnot. What if it wouldn't get them onto the streets? And that's something which we don't see discussed very often. You know, we hear a lot about this distinction between digital natives and digital, uh, you know, immigrants. What we don't hear about is the distinction between digital renegades and digital captives, which I think is a much more important one because we need to know how exactly technology influences their you know, civic engagement and their propensity to actually go and engage in protest of any sort. But you see that even entertainment in places like Russia is actually extremely political. I mean, you see even computer games now which try to offer a radically different geopolitical perspective on the world. So that's a game called Stalin versus Martians, which is one of the most popular games in Russia now, which basically argues that in 1944, Stalin had to fight not only the Germans, but also the Martians. And for that reason, you know, his achievement is even greater than we thought it was, right? And again, it's, it's, it's extremely popular and it's extremely, you know, uh, captivating. Uh, one uh, last piece of stat, statistics which I would like to show is uh, the attitudes of uh, American and Chinese teenagers uh, to, uh, you know, the internet. You can actually see in that last bit of data I highlighted at the bottom that the percentage of Chinese teenagers who say that the internet broadens their sex life is actually quite higher than the percentage of American teenagers who say the same thing. Again, and this is very natural. You know, this last graph will probably get you thinking uh, in, in our land here, but we have to go back to Maslow and actually start thinking about how this, you know, pyramids of needs can actually be applied to cyberspace. And it may as well be that when you are coming, you know, when you are bringing internet to China, Russia, or Iran, at the very beginning, what people would want to do online is, you know, have fun, you know, explore pornography or YouTube or videos of funny cats and move on to talking and sharing. Some may want to go and explore learning. Eventually, they may want to campaign. Some of them will go and start downloading reports from Human Rights Watch, but most of them will still be downloading pornography. And that's a very important perspective to keep in mind. And uh, I will end here, and I'd be happy to answer any questions. Thank you.